Hallelujah. I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. And uh, today we've been talking about destiny already in the music and songs written. With, uh, uh, we went into the future in music in the frequencies. We brought it back to today. When we came back into today, it looked like it was a big bright day all at once. Because the, the future is, is, is the darkness that God speaks of, of his that darkness goes before him and so forth. He's talking about mystery. He's talking about things that, that, are, that he has there for you and I. Hallelujah. You know, you have to remember, put up Jeremiah 29, 11, I believe it is. Let's put that up there. And just look at a, a familiar passage of Scripture today. And um, I believe that's where I want to be. Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. One translation says to give you a future. It says to give you a future. See, God speaks to us from the place of no sin. He speaks to us from our tomorrow. See, there's no sin in your tomorrow because you haven't gotten there yet to mess that tomorrow up. So there's no sin there. You have no sin in your tomorrow, and God talks to you from that place. And so when we start to listen from that place, you know, people say, well, you know, uh, the Lord told me this yesterday. They say, well, you know, um, I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could hear God clearly and this and that. You know, the hearing God clearly Hearing him speak very clearly depends on your willingness to listen. That depends on our willingness as people to listen to him, to hear him clearly. Because we want to hear God based on what our religion told us he sounds like, what our Sunday school we grew up in said he sounds like. All of that is just, it, it's, we want to hear him in that. And he's not speaking that way a lot of times. So we have to, it, it depends on our willingness to listen. If God comes to you and says, I only have good thoughts toward you. You know, uh, did you realize this is something a lot of people don't know, that bad thoughts can't even enter his thinking? People don't even realize that. Bad thoughts don't enter the thoughts of God. He says, I know the thoughts I have toward you. Thoughts of good. He don't think bad. It never enters his mind. And so you have to remember that. And people say, well, but God may hurt me. God may No, God can't hurt you. He don't have bad in him. People say, well, God is disappointed in me. Well, then he wouldn't be any bigger than you. What you're dealing with is, a, is, is no knowledge of the government of God based on the person of God. And, and you blame things in the government that comes up from seed sown on God's person doing it. When the government of God was given to us to live free. Now, Adam worshipped in a prophetic worship. He worshipped from his destiny. He worshipped in the garden in the cool of the day. The scripture says he would he, God would come, the Lord God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is the time the spirit would move. And there was a time of day when Adam would go into a prophetic, euphoric type worship. And he would worship God and he would worship him. But you have to remember something now. Adam was a, a creature of destiny. He was a man in the image and the likeness of God, created in his image, in his likeness to operate beyond what you could see. Now, let me see if I can set this up a little. Look in Genesis chapter 1. Now, we'll look at 1, and we'll start out right here in verse 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. It was on this day that everything that had seed within itself in the earth was planted in the earth. 
And it was actually on this day that the Lord God made, God himself made a cast of himself and lay down in the wet earth when the mist would come and water it. It was on this day that he made a cast of himself. He would have laid down and disappeared under the mist of the glory that had rose up from the, from the, the streams that, of light that came from paradise. Scripture said there was a, a river that came out of the garden and, and watered the garden, came out of Eden and watered the garden. This is coming from paradise. And these rivers broke into four heads to water the earth. So when it came out, in Hebrew we find out it was light. It was rivers of light underground. Revelation knowledge of God. And God misted the earth with his glory and his revelation. And he laid down in the wet earth on day three. And he cast an image of himself under the ground. And David picked up on it in Psalm 139 when he said in one translation, it says, you made me in your underground workshop. And so in that place, God cast his own image on day three. But then on day six, three days and nights later, the Lord uncovered the ground like a grave and laid down on the body of the man and breathed into his nostrils, and raised him up out of the grave, and man was living in the future at that point. Already it was a prophecy that one day God himself would take flesh, and he would be buried, die and be buried, and after three days and nights rise from the dead. He would be raised again. Now, this was told in the beginning so that redemption was already built into the earth. And the earth and everything in it that went through all the creation would realize no matter what man decided in destiny to do, that there was already a redemptive plan in the earth. And the earth would remember it and help make way for it to come. Is this too heavy? Am I making sense? Okay, so, and it would go throughout all the earth. So the, the earth has memory and the ground has memory. Just like you have muscle memory. Well, you're made out of dirt. The dirt has memory. And so Adam, his very life was a prophecy of a day to come. And so he raised him from the, from the grave. Now watch what it says here, though. It says that in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them. So everything in Genesis 26 was said into the man's future. Yeah. It, was all, it was said out ahead of him before he was raised and spoke to. It was out ahead of him. Now that's on purpose. That's not by accident. That's on, on purpose. Now go back and look at 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 Jeremiah 29, 11 again, put that up there and look at this one more time. It says in God, uh, says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Now listen, thoughts of peace. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, making a step toward you. I know these thoughts that I'm thinking that are moving toward you. Oh, my goodness. He said, I know the thoughts that I'm thinking that's moving toward you. He said, they're thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future or an expected end. Now, watch this, how Jesus gives us this. Um, he gives us this in Matthew, just a an absolute uh, profound revelation that he lets us know right here. I want you to look at this. In Matthew 4, then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he afterward was afterward and hungered. Now it says he was led into the wilderness. That's the Hebrew word uh, uh, to speak. 
It literally means to speak. So he went out there to hear his father speak about the revelation he got at Jordan when the heavens opened. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So Jesus goes into the wilderness to fast and pray to hear his father give him the full revelation of what he had just heard. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God. So he heard at Jordan destiny. And so the enemy is now, he has the full revelation of, of what he is to do, how he's supposed to, how he's going to bring mankind back. He committed to it in that baptism at the Jordan. He said, if you be the son of God, trying to challenge his identity, command that these stones be made bread. Notice the first thing he did was try to challenge his identity to keep him from his destiny. Did you notice that? Now watch what he says. But he answered and said, it is written. So Jesus goes to the word. He goes to the written word to secure everything. He says, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. Now remember, he was hungry. He was being tempted. So while he's being tempted, tempted to, he knows he can't respond during his, a pull on his flesh. So he goes to the written word and says it is, it is established here. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Man lives that way. In other words, you're one word behind God all the time. God is out ahead of you speaking toward you, talking toward you. And Jesus knew at that moment he wouldn't trust it in, in his desire to eat. He immediately went to the written word. Because that's what you and I are supposed to do. When identity is trying to be stolen from us, it's to keep you out of your destiny. But notice what Jesus said. He said, God's out ahead of you speaking and you're living by those words. So what we're doing and what we have to do is we walk toward destiny. We begin to walk toward our future. He has a future for us. And so we have to begin to walk toward that. Adam worshiped in a prophetic worship. He worshiped from his destiny, from his future, from where God called him to be. Those words he spoke out ahead of him. Then he spoke into Adam and confirmed those words and put a desire in the man to go toward that destiny. And man started walking toward his future walking toward his future. And so Adam would worship according to this future. He didn't worship according to anything else. You say, well, you know, most people worship according to their past. That's why they stop and start repenting on the spot. Because they're worshiping according to a sin consciousness, according to their past, according to the fear they grew up in. Or they're worshiping according to religion or according to something like that. They're not worshiping according to the destiny that God has spoken ahead of them. That's why when a prophet stands before someone in a personal uh, prophecy, say we're going to give a personal prophecy, usually you never hear the future immediately. You hear something in their past or something going on in their life because it's holding them down, keeping them from a future. Hallelujah. So let's go back to Genesis two. And I want to look at that just a moment. And I hope we're getting something out of this. Now, this is kind of different today, but it's a day to avoid deception and walk in destiny. The only reason people get deceived is they're robbed of their identity. The only reason God's people do. Now, watch this. So it says here that, you know, that the Lord would uh, 
came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. We see that in Genesis 3. And he comes in the garden in the cool of the day. This was a time he would come into Adam's worship. I said Genesis 2 is Genesis 3. Would come into Adam's worship and Adam would begin to worship. Now imagine what he's doing. I want you to imagine what Adam is doing right now. He's worshiping according to his destiny. He's not worshiping according to anything else. He didn't have a past. He would worship every day according to his destiny. And he would be worshiping, seeing his destiny, seeing to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. That means he had a knowledge of what caused the plenishing of the earth, the plentifulness of the earth and Lucifer's war to be destroyed. He had a knowledge of that. He had a knowledge of all this. And he knew what his job, his mission was. He showed him where the gold was the, at Havilah, where there's gold. He intended on Adam to set up a commerce system in the earth. He intended on him to do that. And he wanted him to set it up so that everyone could prosper. And everyone that was coming would have a, a, a prosperity. You know, um, if I could find this in here, there is... There is a, when you start talking about that prosperity, that land of Havila and so forth, it actually talks about that there is a, God was setting up a system on giving, giving that men would know how to give and how to love. In other words, the commerce system God had in order to set up looked a lot different than this one, way different. And so Adam would be worshiping according to all of this. He would be looking at his destiny. He would be looking at his six days or his 6,000 years to have dominion in the earth and how he would do it all. And the Hebrew reveals to us that while he was worshiping, the Lord would come up in the life of the day and speak to him. He would walk up in the life of the day and talk to him. And take him to heaven where he was. And he would sit there on the heavenly ark of the covenant, the seat of blood. And him and his father would commune. He would come back to the earth and the Lord would appear in the life of the day and walk with him in the garden. All in prophetic. It literally says prophetic worship. And so they would be looking. He'd worshiping, looking at the future. A worship from the place of destiny is a worship. Is, is different from the worship of where you are. Listen to this close. Worshiping prophetically is worshiping from your mature destiny and not your immature present. Worshiping, I'm going to say it again, prophetically is worshiping from your mature destiny out ahead of you, not your immature present you live in. Prophetic worship can actually make tomorrow, today. Hallelujah. There's all kinds of things can be done in light and time. And Jesus is light. His word is light. The entrance of his word bringeth light or giveth light. So it, it deals with future. You know, just for example, I wrote this fact down for you. I'll just tell you a little of it. <clears throat> the closest star to our, to us is a star, uh, Alpha Centauri. That's the closest star. It actually exists. It's 4.5 light years from us. Now, imagine that. Light years is how fast it takes traveling at the speed of light and you, to get a year ahead, you know, and so forth. So imagine there's two people. They're twins born at the exact moment. One of them leaves here, and he's heading out toward that star traveling at half the speed of light. And it will take him nine years to get there and nine years to get back. On his clock, when he comes back, he will have, listen to this, he will have become two years and five months younger than his brother. Traveling into time, out and the speed escaping time. Now think about this at the, if you went at the full speed of light, when he gets back, 
he would only have noticed on his watch, his calendar, 33 days have gone by. Now just think of that. So light and time and your future, it's out there where God is. He's uninhibited by time. And you can get out beyond it and look at what's happening. And, and even science knows that every action, every event in the earth is a reflection of light that hits the earth and bounces off and hurls itself out into space somewhere. And they say if you could get out ahead of it, you could see it all happen again. So one day when you're in heaven, the, you'll want to see what the Red Sea looked like parting, and God will just take you out beyond time and show you the pictures hurling itself through space. And you can just look at it all again, just like it happened. So God is out ahead of us, and he said, I'm out here thinking thoughts toward you. And so when you go into a prophetic worship and you begin to worship according to destiny, you start rendezvousing with those thoughts. And you'll hit them head on. And when you get up beyond your present circumstances, the only way to do that is start speaking the promises out of the word. Worship according to the written word. If you don't, I'm telling you, he will steal your identity. And if he can steal your identity, the enemy will keep you out of your destiny. No wonder the scripture says, you know, he would renew our youth like the eagle. Think of that. Our youth can be turned back. We know that's a fact because Sarah's youth went backward. Abraham and Sarah, their, her youth went backward. She went all the way back to the point of virginity. That's why Isaac was a type of Jesus. And the covenant Abraham made, he, he, he made himself, the, he cut himself in the circumcision so that the seed would pass through the covenant into the woman who had went back in time. And so his son could be a type and shadow of Jesus to come. And time was reversed. Remember Hezekiah told Isaiah, Isaiah said, You've been given 15 more years. The Lord says you have. And he said, and he said, do you, what kind of proof do you want? Do you want the sun to go forward 10 degrees or backward 10 degrees? He said, it's a light thing to go forward. Let it go backward. So he turned the time backward. And things went back in order in Hezekiah's life. And so time is a place that God walks around in and prophets walk in that time and the prophetic looks into that time. And so if we begin to worship according to the future, the written word says we have. This is the, this is the book not bound by time. Have you ever noticed that people that leave this earth early or they, they die and leave this earth? Have you noticed this, that when they're out, they're gone, that you lo you'll look back one day and say, my God, they've been gone five years. They've been gone 15 years, and it seems like yesterday. It's because time is not attached to them anymore. They're out beyond time somewhere, and it just goes by without attaching itself to their name. You think about that. So we need to begin to worship according to our destiny, not according to our present circumstances. The only way to do that is to look up the promises in the word and begin to speak those. Hallelujah. So I wanted to talk to you about that today. I wanted to give you some, some thoughts about future and destiny and I wanted to tell you, too, that in the world, what you see with the LGBTQ, BLM, all these groups that do nothing but cause civil unrest and take peace away, they're sent to take your, the enemy's using that to take your destiny because it will rob you of your identity. And now they've convinced this world that we need to mutilate children Science should mutilate them and turn them from boys to girls and girls to boys. But the fact still remains. When those bodies are dust and bones, 
someone who didn't know that happened would look at their bones and say, that's a woman. Or, that's a man because nothing really changes. It's identity stolen. It's real identity theft to the lethal point. Somebody can steal somebody's identity in the earth and buy something on their credit card or something. That's, that's tragic and that, that's awful. But when a soul's identity has been stolen and they go their whole life used by the devil, they have no future. And some of them just lose it and go off on a violent tangent or something. And they don't know what they've done. Because demons have tormented their minds. You know, I was listening uh, to a story a friend of mine was telling. And he actually was telling it to Robin. And, and it was a, he's a policeman. and He's talking about answering this call in this apartment complex or some hideous thing that was, had been going on. And they, they found it, stopped it. But then upstairs above them, they heard this screaming, like a woman screaming, like she was just being tortured and, and, and mutilated and all whatever, just screaming. So they took off upstairs, the officer did. And my friend was a lieutenant then. And he, was, he went upstairs and he, they went through the door and where the screaming was coming from. And when they opened, got the door open, there was a man standing there in a full Nazi uniform with a pistol in his belt. And he was screaming. He had been screaming like a woman. They thought it was a woman. And when they came in and talked to him, disarmed him, talked to him, he said, they said, why was you screaming like a woman? He had teddy bears everywhere. And he had pictures of him and teddy bears. He said, I have to scream like that to silence their voices. And so when they found out who he was, man, he was, he had a legitimate job, was awarded for great things. They called his wife. They said, he's screaming and doing this and that. She said, yeah, he has to do that to silence the quiet and the voices of, of those things. Now what had happened? The man's in a Nazi uniform, screaming like a woman. He's lost his identity. He don't even know he's a man anymore. He don't know what he is anymore. And that happened. See, if the enemy can get you and get your identity away from you, people start searching for an identity in drugs, sinful lifestyles, anything. Some of them go off the deep end, become serial killers, do all kinds of stuff because they have no more identity. And once identity is stolen, demons replace it with something. And they seek to take control. Jesus told the man, madman of Gadara, he said, what is your name? He said, I am Legion, for we are many. Well, that wasn't the man's name. His identity was gone. So we have, to, we have to guard that and begin to worship according to who God says we are. He says we're healed, we're healed. We worship that way. He says you're prosperous, you're prosperous. You worship that way. He says you have peace of mind, you have peace of mind. You worship that way. He says he hadn't given you the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. You worship without fear. You worship according to the word. You can't worship according to what your flesh feels at the moment. Even Jesus didn't do that. He went to the written word and said, it is written because he was hungry. And he wouldn't give the devil an edge. <clears throat> and it was a temptation. He could have commanded stones to be bred. He could have done that, but then he would have been living by the words of Satan speaking from a immature present and from a degraded present around him. But he said, man will not live that way. Man lives by every word that's coming out of the mouth of God coming toward me. And so he stood on the written word. And so that's what I wanted to tell you today.
about destiny. Hallelujah. 